All right, welcome to News Talk 830 WCCO. My name is Henry Lake, and I want to welcome you to our Race and Racism Conversation series that we have on this station. Phenomenal series hosted by Dr. Verna Price, who will be joining us in just one second. But tonight's topic is, and the title of this show, is In the Room Where It Happened, Conversations on Racism That Matter to All of us. And let's bring our host, Dr. Verna Price, into the conversation here, and she will introduce our panel for this evening. Dr. Price, uh, pleasure to be on the air with you tonight. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for coming on the air with me. I appreciate that. And for really joining me with this conversation. You know, right before, right before um, we got on, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to quick Google um, just some of the stats on right on on technology and the use of technology and there's a study that was done out of out of a team of uh in in new orleans and it's called it's just like a simple technology facts and stacks R really like it's amazing so over 3.8 billion people use the internet today which is 40 percent of the world's population amazing right eight billion devices will be connected to the internet Right now, we have over 8 billion devices connected to the internet. Here's amazing. Every minute, how many websites do you think are created every minute? Just give me a guess. Just give me a guess. Ooh. Every minute? Every minute. Um, every minute. I will say that's that's a loaded question. Five. Huh? What do you think? I was going to say I was going to say a half a million. 570 new websites every minute is being oh. is being uploaded every minute oh, there are every three, single minute of the day every okay, single you. minute of the day 570 new websites amazing right there yeah. are over 3.5 billion searches per day billion henry on on google listen to this now this like blows my mind right okay every 24 hours a video every minute 24 hours of video is uploaded to YouTube hmm. every minute, 24 hours of video uploaded to YouTube. So this conversation tonight on racism and the media and all of what the media does and how it actually creates a narrative for our society. It's like, it's a critical conversation. You know, when you think about like, what is the role of the media? When we first started this, this conversation in the room where it happens, it really started with um, the brutal assassination of George Floyd in our very own South Minneapolis. Um, and after that assassination, I started getting a lot of phone calls. And Henry, they were from, these phone calls came from what I would say are my white colleagues Mm -hmm. who are good people doing good work in this world but they that this this particular you know um 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 uh gladwell calls it in his book the tipping point it was like a tipping point of race relations right a tipping point of understanding racism in our society and or at least being aware of it so there was like this awakening by my white colleagues and they started calling me and they were saying Dr. Verna, what should I do? You know, I don't know what to do with this. I, I don't know what to say. I don't, you know, what is happening here? Help me talk about racism. Yeah. And what really came to me was that it was necessary for us to have these conversations, particularly with white people. Because here's what I find is that my white friends and colleagues, they want to do the work, but they don't necessarily know how to do the work. And here's the other reality is because racism race you know there's only one race henry there's only one race it's a human race we know yep. that right yep. and we know that racism races is a political construct it's a construct created to divide a society into a majority superior and a minority inferior you know majority superior being white people and this is a political construct it's it was designed by a group of wealthy white men put into place to divide this society. And so that construct then connects with these systems. And one of the systems that's a powerful system that has been a vehicle, I believe, for moving this construct ahead. Um, and all the research tells us is the media. 
So when we were putting these conversations together, I thought it's critical for us to have this conversation of what is the role of the media and how do we today, how do we today change that construct because of our power? Just think about that. Right now, how many people are on the internet? Right now, how many people have access to this very, very Facebook live radio talk show that we're doing right now? And what does that mean in terms of what messages, messages and narrative we're creating? So I know you've been in the media for a while, right? Mm -hmm. And yep. I, I haven't. This is like brand new to me. I'm a teacher. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I love to teach people. I want people to be better and do better. And here's what I think. I think we can overcome and eradicate racism out of our society. I really do believe that one person at a time. But first, we have to have the hard conversations before we can get to what to do. So in your work in the media, you know, what have you experienced? What's been some of your own experiences with racism in the media? Yeah. So, you know, and, and I, I love the way that you just started off the conversation, Dr. Price. That's that's Thank amazing you. because, you know, we when we start to tend to think about race, I think that some of us we we look at race and we kind of just scratch the surface of what the actual mm -hmm. conversations are, right? So we have to go a little bit deeper. Absolutely. But, but with regards to your your question, my own personal experience with racism in the media is. Um, it's been a little bit of a different, I think, experience than most black folks here. Mm -hmm. I've dealt with the the nasty emails from people um, before that have sent stuff to me in my years of working um, at you know multiple different outlets. And I've actually gotten the hate mail before. It's like the actual hate mail where they've written letters, you know, people sending them in with the return address on there, which is, uh, you know, which is mind blowing to me. Right. And my uh, employers were alerted to certain things. But I, I say that my experience is 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 different just because I've been privileged. Mm. And, and let me explain that. Yeah. Explain that so, to me. So I'm not saying privileged as though I didn't work hard because I've worked my butt off to be in this situation and, and mm -hmm. to have a platform that I have. And I've outworked so many people and I created an, an interest in sports that nobody at the time cared about. Okay. Mm -hmm. But in this market, I've worked in the mainstream media. Mm -hmm. I've worked at two specific radio stations. KFAN is where I got my start. And now I'm at WCCO. Mm -hmm. And so that credibility that I've garnered working with those brands. Okay. And those platforms, I think in some way has shielded me to a certain degree from mm -hmm. some of the racism that we see in the media mm. now now clearly i've i've had to deal with it um and um i acknowledge it and i you know i pay close attention to everything that goes on surrounding me right and i feel it when folks aren't truly feeling me i can i can feel that you in can a, feel right? that yeah sure. but i can't say that the doors um have been completely shut to me at times mm -hmm. the same way that my friends at the minneapolis spokesman recorder have had mm. to do or mm. that my friends at Insight News have had to deal with. Right, um, right. Doors have been open to me just because of the the outlets that I've worked with. And so I've dealt with it, but I don't think that I've dealt with it as much as maybe some other African Americans have dealt with it. Sure, 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 sure. And when you say, um, um, you know, as you've seen it in the media, mm -hmm. um, you know, we're in the we're in the Midwest, right? We're yep. in Minnesota. Yep. And here's the reality is that in Minnesota still, you know, um, the census in the last census, and, and hopefully this will change a bit in this new census, but in the last census, Minnesota was still 89.9% Caucasian people, mm. right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's not a whole lot of ethnic diversity when you really look at it broadly. Yep. So when you think about, um, you know, how our local media has either dealt with racism or not perpetuated racism or not mm -hmm. what what's been your experience in in that yeah well you know one of the things that's interesting is that outside of being a minnesotan mm -hmm. and being in multiple different places here in my time in the media i also lived in kansas city for mm -hmm. five and a half years right and kansas city is not as diverse as the twin cities Right. It, just, it isn't right. Mm -hmm. 
But their media, though, seems to be at least a little bit more diverse, which I mm. find rather interesting. Like mm. when I think of Minneapolis, St. Paul and our state, you know, there's some a Somali community. Mm -hmm. um, we have the Hmong community here. Sure. Um, a, 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 we have we have a, a, a melting pot of so many different cultures and races. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Where a place like Kansas City doesn't have. Right. But when you look at our media, yeah. it's not like that. Right. Like you may see a black face here and there. You may sure. see an Asian face here and there, but it's, it's not truly um, representative of the people that are here, at least in the, in the Metro area. Right. Right. So, so, so yeah, it's, I think when you laid out the numbers there and you talked about the 89%, mm -hmm. that's, that's real. That, that's that's real. A real, that's a real thing. But when we start diving into the diversity of ideas and cultures and Absolutely. all of that, I don't think that at times people really get it. Wow. 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 Well, we have a panel that's joining us tonight and um, a very diverse panel. Here's here's what's so amazing about this. I've other than one of the one person on the panel. I don't know any of these people, Henry, like literally they have volunteered to come into this conversation and I'm so proud of them and courageous. They're very courageous to be here. Right. So I'm going to introduce them one by one. Um, I have Miss Patricia Lopez. Um, come on in, Miss Patricia. And I'm just going to ask you to just quickly just give us a one sentence about you. Um, I'm an editorial writer with the Star Tribune. I've been a journalist in the Twin Cities for a uh, little over 20, uh, 20 years. 20, 20 something years, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, born and raised in Chicago. Thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight, we also have um, Todd Walker joining us. Come on in, Todd. Hi, guys. Thanks hey. for uh, thanks for including me. Yes, I'm a journalist in the Twin Cities market as well. I've worked in print, radio, TV, and reality television. Born and raised right here in St. Paul, where I am calling in from tonight. All right. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to the conversation. And joining the conversation, we also have John Hansen. Come on in, John. Yeah. Hello. I uh, born and raised here as well, and. Um, have spent time in both television and radio, mostly radio, mostly sports. But now I sit here today as a brand manager of News Talk 830 WCCO. And uh, I also, I've had a stint in uh, Las Vegas and with Henry there in Kansas City. All right. Welcome, John. Welcome. And we also have joining us um, Christy Pyle. Come on in, Christy. Welcome to the conversation. Thank you. It's Christy Peel. Peel, I, thank um, you. Thank you. You're welcome. I was born and raised in Hutchinson and have worked at five different television stations across the Midwest. And for the last 10 years, have owned a public relations agency, Media Minefield. We mostly hire journalists from all over the country and our clients. I get this weird view of the media now because our clients are interviewed by, we have over a hundred interviews a week at different TV and radio and podcasts across the country. So I have a local perspective and a national perspective. Nice, nice. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And I did go to your website and you've got a really fun website. Um, you and, and Todd look like you have a lot of fun here. You really do. And Patricia, I went to your website and you you were you were working, I'm telling you. You were just like working and making it happen. I was like, all right. So in this conversation then, it's about racism in the media. Um, we're going to start the conversation about your own personal experience, either seeing racism in the media, being a part of racism in the media, um, hearing about it, feeling it, a story that you've been a part of as you've seen it in the media. Um, and we'll start with that conversation. Who wants to start? I'll, I'll jump in uh, sure. right away. Uh, um, you know, I... I uh, there's several several different ways. I mean, I've I've um, it's to me it starts with with um, leadership, and you know, and uh, when we took a, take a look at the issue of racism, we look at at you know systemic racism and something you you were talking about just earlier here tonight, Dr. Price, and um, you know, uh, you look at the conferences that I go to, the meetings that I'm in with leadership, and not just people with our own company, but all over the place. Um, especially for my time in, in the sport field, it was almost all white men, um, like you had alluded to earlier in the, the very, um, you know, beginning of the, of the practices in this country 
almost all white men. And so um, when decisions are made, uh, you've asked me in the past, you know, where where racism comes comes in, and and every I think every decision that's made, uh, ha, you know, can can be put back to that in in some way, shape, or form, and that that are expected to make big decisions it's a uh, uh, tend to be white men and so that's something that uh, I know when uh, I got in the business 25 years ago people uh, would tell me that that was something that was hopefully going to change over the next 25 years but it's been 25 years and we're still you know we're still dealing with it and I know mm. we, we were dealing with it long before that so um, I've I've uh, I've sadly been uh, around to see some of the things uh, that some of my um, uh, African American employees in the past have had to deal with, um, you know, and, um, you know, Henry has been one of those. And, uh, and you know, we have this thing called the text line that can be awfully ugly. Uh, they don't have to mail it in anymore. And, and I'm telling you something, it is, it is, uh, it could be awfully nasty. Um, and so talk about courage. Um, you talk about, you know, an African-American talk show host like a Henry Lake, who has been, uh, I've known Henry for a long time and Henry's at two different stops with me now, and I've been very fortunate uh, to have Henry with me. But but there's a person who puts himself on the line every time he speaks, mm. and uh, and the stuff I'll say the crap sometimes that he has to deal with is is just that you know. So yeah, well, so what you're saying is that it's real that we're not just making uh, this up. <laughs> we're no. not just having a theoretical conversation yeah. no, here, right? No, it, you know, <laughs> this and, is and, not just a theory. <laughs> right, right. And, and honestly, uh, you know, it, you, you, tonight's conversation is about racism, but I've seen it in television and the way that women have to deal with reaction from audiences as opposed to men. And, you know, and, and the way, you know, when you're not a white man, when you're a white male, you're, you're uh, you know, you're, you're pretty well safe from that stuff. You still mm. hear it, but it's mostly about the, the content of what you speak, not of who you are. Right. You know, right. I'll jump in there, work. John. Go ahead, Todd. You know, I'll jump in there, John. I, you know, having worked in this market pretty much my, well, my entire career, I don't, can't recall one time that I was even in a hiring room with a person of, of color other than a, you know, a pretty much white males uh, from, from print, from radio, from TV, you know, occasionally a, a female here and there, but it's it's been predominantly for me, uh, the person that was in charge of my next stage in my career have been white guys, you know? Right, right, right. Absolutely. Wow, Todd. Wow, wow. Uh, Miss Patricia, Miss Christie, what do you think? Um, you know, I, uh, I wanted to talk about this from a little different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, someone who has watched uh, all of this, and even I think before we were able to put the name systemic racism uh, to it. I, I think a lot of us were unaware that that's what was actually happening. Mm. When I was uh, a very young reporter in Los Angeles working for uh, a wire service, um, I was assigned to the overnight shift at the police center. It's like the worst possible shift where all the beginners start. Um, I very quickly learned that if there was a murder involving people of color, um, that was called a misdemeanor murder and we weren't to write about it. It wasn't worth it. Nobody would pick it up. Um, so with very few exceptions, you you didn't do that. And it was shocking to me um, at the time. I, you know, there were other things that happened along the way. I did ride alongs with um, police in Southern California where they would routinely head to certain neighborhoods, stop young men of color on the street, just kind of roust them. Where are you going? what's going on with you, you know, let me stop you, let me frisk you. Um, I'm not even sure they were aware that they were racially profiling um, those young people. I tried to ask them, why are you stopping this one and not this one? And they couldn't even articulate it beyond, well, I have a feeling, you know, and then the young man would say, well, I'm going to my aunt's house. Oh, okay, go on then. Uh, so it's just little things like that over and over and over in every system that you deal with before I got a job in journalism when I was still in college. I got a part-time job processing uh, loans, mortgages for homes. And that was the first time that I saw restrictive covenants in mortgages by the thousands. Um, they were in many, many mortgages in, uh, you know, across Southern California. They weren't valid anymore, but they were still there. Little artifacts from a time when you could say no black people could live in Anaheim 
or no Mexican people could live in Santa Ana or no Jewish people could live in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just, these were built in and we didn't recognize it. Now we do. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's our obligation to call this out and to change it wherever we can. Right. And, and you know, Patricia, it's putting language to it. It's putting language yes. to it. You know, um, um, I, I, we're, we're going to come back to that. But thank you so much for sharing. What about you, Christy? You know, I have this, I agree with all the all that you've said so far. And when I think about how white media still is, I think about the sadness that children can't be mm. what they don't see. Mm. And we need to have more black and brown and diverse faces in media. And I think that the unfortunate thing is the media you can see are the people on TV and newspapers and podcasts and all the different other platforms need to make sure that there are faces connected with bylines and people making decisions, the news managers, those are the people who have power in newsrooms and we hardly even know their names or see them. And that's how we can start holding some of these news organizations accountable to make sure that there is some diversity. And in thinking about media, I'm, I'm on the pure journalist side and, and, and it frustrates me when entertainment or opinion shows get lumped into news. And mm -hmm. so when people on opinion or that they look like news shows, they do, they, the set is there, but mm -hmm. these are people giving their opinions. Mm -hmm. And they oftentimes, and we've seen it in the last election cycle, cross lines, cross racial lines, say things they shouldn't, mm -hmm. um, if they were journalists, but their opinion. So mm -hmm. they're putting that out there and then it's being shared on social media and perpetuated and people believe this is news and these are journalists speaking. They're not journalists, they're entertainers, they're people giving opinions. And that to me is another thing that we need to fix is to separate between journalists who, man, the journalists I work with, th these are good people trying to do mm -hmm. good stories, trying to not be biased and racist, but it's a, it's a difficult, difficult to navigate. It really is. Dr. Mm -hmm. Price, if I could add yes. too Go that, ahead. Go ahead. Uh, um, um, you know, a lot of what I've managed over the years has been opinion based shows. And I could tell you, I've been a little, uh, I won't say surprised, but, but I think saddened is almost the word I've had employees come to me, uh, African American employees come to me that have said, you know, on a controversial subject, you know, how far can I go? What can I say about mm. this? And I don't have white employees ask me that. Uh, and it's not fair, <laughs> no, so, um, yeah, obviously I say, say what's in your heart, you know, and, uh, it's just, I, I just, it's, it's too bad that that question even has to come up. You know, right. Sure. Dr. Ahead, Price, uh, mm -hmm. you know, as Christy was saying, I was talking to a friend and a colleague of mine, uh, recently who was a non-white person. And I said, we were talking about you know, what you wanted to do when you grew up and what you want to do in your career. I always looked at the people that the people that were in power looked like my mom and dad. Mm -hmm. So I knew that they looked like my mom and dad. I could probably do that job, whether it be political or I could work in television. And the, the person I was talking to was, was a, an African American woman of color. And she would say, said to me, I never looked at anybody that was a person of power that looked like me. And mm. so I never thought those things were attainable because we always looked at our mom and dad as being those people of power. And these are things that we can then go on and do. But man, not ever seeing people reflected in the positions you wanted in politics or in television. I can't imagine what that would have done to me because I always knew I wanted to be in, in entertainment. But I looked at it was attainable because that, but that's what they looked like. Right. And the no, visual, I, the visual. Go ahead, Henry. I think that Christy brings up a great point in terms of talking about because representation matters. Right. Mm -hmm. We all understand that the, the diversity and opinions and knowing that, you know, there's so many people out there that need to we need to hear their voices. Right. But for me, one of the things that I appreciate the compliments from from John earlier, um, one of the things that I take great pride in is is knowing that um, I'm unafraid of mm -hmm. using my voice and using my platform. And the reason why I'm unafraid is because I was built for moments like this, the mm -hmm. America that we live in. I went to Morehouse College in Atlanta to follow in the footsteps of Martin Luther King Jr. and all the other um, great men because I wanted to do something great and utilize my voice and, and speak truth to power. That's mm -hmm. the reason why I, I do what I do. And, and knowing that, I know that there's always gonna be pushback. 
right? Because there's there's going to be a lot of people that won't agree with a lot of things that I have to say. And I don't have a problem with that. And, you know, I look back to a few years ago when I was in Kansas City and you had Colin Kaepernick happen. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I talked about that moment. Mm -hmm. And I had said to some of my, you know, colleagues, um, my white colleagues, I'm like, this is a Muhammad Ali moment here mm -hmm. because what he's doing and what he's saying People right now, there's a lot of backlash and they're hating it, right? Mm -hmm. But we know how this works. Just look at America 20 years from now. And it's not even really 20 years from now. We're like four or five years removed from Colin Kaepernick, you know, and, and the, the kneeling and all that. But like people are saying, yeah, mm -hmm. what, what he's saying is right. Mm -hmm. And he's a hero. And we should we should acknowledge you know, his thoughts and what he's doing and, and how he's trying to represent, right? But remember when Muhammad Ali and he wasn't going to go to Vietnam and all that stuff, whatever, and everybody was talking about how terrible a human being he was, right? Mm -hmm. But now we love Muhammad Ali. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can see right now that we can hold up Colin Kaepernick and say, you know what? We get it. A lot of people don't want to do that right now, but guaranteed, and this is the way it works, the United States of America, 20 years from now, he will be celebrated and given all the, the flowers and roses and everything. So the question becomes, as we were about, we're about to go into a break here, the question becomes then, um, we're in 2020, and it, we know that racism is real. It's real. We're, we're not making this up. That we're, this is not Black people complaining. This, it's real. It's systemic. Racism is racial prejudice that has been put into a systemic structure that's connected with systemic power. That's racism. And it's reflected in every category of our society. So the question is then, when we look at the media, and you're in the media, what are those tangible ways that racism is being reflected and how is the media impacting whether or not we actually disrupt racism and become an anti-racist society and or we continue to perpetuate that? That really becomes a really, really big question in front of us because more than ever before, Right. When you have 40 percent of the world's population with an access to a cell phone and there is constant media, there's a constant story coming in. There's constant, like you say, Miss um, Christie, the visual is constantly coming in. What are we going to do to disrupt that? And where do we start right here in Minnesota? That's where we're going to go with that conversation as we go kind of to the next level. And just think about your own personal experiences and what really what that has meant um, to you in this in this work. I'll tell you, really, you know, years ago, um, I. I I'm not a big movie person, but when I did used to go to movies and, and they had these really big blockbusters, it was really interesting how um, there would be a black person who would show up in the movie. And sure enough, you know, my friends and I, or my family and I, we would go, um, he's going to die in 30 seconds. And sure enough, like within 30 <laughs> seconds, the one black person in the movie would just be done. And then the rest of the movie, sure. I mean, we would just sit there and we would just calculate, you know, like five. Four, three, two, one, boom, he's gone. You know, the one black person is done with the movie. And then all of a sudden, you know, the rest of the movie are all white people. And um, the visual of where do I fit into all of this really becomes the question. So be thinking about that as, as, as we go into the break and be thinking about where do you start with where you are right now and how with the media, our own media, starting here in Minnesota and moving throughout the country, how do we get to this place where we, with the media, helped to create racism? And how can the media help to disrupt it and eradicate it? That's where we're going from here. Your thoughts, Henry? Yeah, we'll, we'll continue the conversation on our Race and Racism Conversation series, Race in the Media, tonight with our uh, our great panel that we've assembled here. Uh, Dr. Verna Price, she's our host. My name is Henry Lake. Uh, we'll be right back here on News Talk 830 WCCO. All right, welcome back to News Talk 830 WCCO in our Race and Racism Conversation Series uh, with our host, Dr. Verna Price. And tonight's topic is race and the media. 
Thank you so much for having us come back here. Brother Henry Lake, I appreciate it. Um, when we left off, um, I said, when we come back, let's talk about like real examples of racism in the media. And here's why I say this. Um, there is a feeling by many people that racism just really isn't real. That if that if if we just if we just work hard enough, you know, if you black people just worked hard enough, if you you non-white people just worked hard enough, you could you could be where I am too, right? And it's not real. Um, and what I want us to make sure is that we are um, helping our community, helping Minnesota, helping our society, helping our nation understand that it is really real. And here's how we know it's real. And here, here's how it's reflected. So Ms. Christie, you said you would, you would uh, start us out with the conversation. Thank you, this is such a fascinating conversation. It's a real honor to be part of it. So in thinking about real examples, I think about how words matter and the power that words and stories have. If we look back to the days after George Floyd was murdered, you can see news stations, uh, platforms, outlets, had an, they had a choice. Are we going to say that he was killed? Are we going to say that he was murdered? And depending upon your perspective and the days that right after that happened, the choice of that word made a really big difference. And I remember specifically being in a newsroom uh, when I, I walked into the newsroom, the decisions were being made about what was going to be on the morning show. And the, converse, the story was about housing. So it was a story about housing and the people making the decision about the angle that story was gonna be told from were white, 20 somethings who lived in apartments. Mm. So if we have 20 somethings who that it doesn't apply to them and you think that's just about housing, you think about how a conversation and decisions about words that are so important, if only white voices are making those decisions and making the choices, we all the stories are gonna be told from a really different perspective than if we have a variety of people around the table with a variety of life experiences saying, you know, when you say that word, it makes me feel like this. That's mm -hmm. really important and that's how we can see the racism in the media and I think it's the it's the key to unlock the change. But how, can, but, but how can we be better? How can we get better? And I, I noticed Dr. Price, uh, in one of your previous uh, shows I, I watched and you talked about you talked about words and usage of words and getting around the table and educating each other. But how can I be better as a journalist? And as Christy is saying, knowing what words to you and yes. if we're going to have open and raw conversations, do I use the word Indian? Do I use the word Native American? Because I, as some of you other reporters out there would probably agree to, I've been called out for using and the word Native American or using the word Indian, using the word costume or clothing, using the word um, African American, black people, brown people. How can we get better and how can we get educated to know what is the appropriate proper terminology and words to you? Well, let, so let me now, Tom, I, I would say, to. I love this. I love this. <laughs> let, let me tell you real quick. Go I, ahead. Because I love what Christy had to say, yeah. and she's 100% right and, and kind of stole my thunder. But it's, it's how the stories are told, yeah. the headlines, the photographs, the pictures that are used to portray the, the subjects of those stories. Like so many times minorities are talked about in such a negative way when it's not supposed to be a negative story at all, you know? Like anybody can create a storyline, but how accurate is the storyline? It's right. never good for someone of any race, right? To be portrayed in a way that's not healthy for their overall success when they shouldn't be part, when that shouldn't be part of the story. So, you know, to answer your question, Todd, it's like, I don't think it's necessarily all about like African-American or Native American or anything like that or whatever, but it's like, it could be something as simple as a photograph. Like right. a lot of times we don't show mug shots for a certain demographic uh, or a certain, you know, a person as opposed mm -hmm. to somebody else. So those are some of the things I know Patricia wanted to yeah. get into. Yeah. And I'm going to come back to your thought as well. You and I'll, I'll kind of, kind of juxtaposition Todd's thought and Christie's thought too. So I'm going to come back to that. Um, Miss Patricia. Um, I, I wanted to say, I think we need to do work that's on a much deeper level um, mm -hmm. that involves challenging preconceived notions. This work is available to anyone. You don't have to be a person of color. You can be a white person. You can be anyone. Just challenge your assumptions 
before you proceed. Um, and I, that is something I try to bring to my work at every level. Um, I, I have written this any number of times. It continually surprises people. Most of the, yeah, a majority of the people on welfare in this state are not black. They are white, right? Um, same goes true for almost any, uh, you know, so-called entitlement program out there. And yet, what are the faces that we see again and again? Unless we make a different choice that is more reflective of who that population actually is, too many times we see a black face. They get associated with poverty, with, um, you know, disinvestment, with all these other things, when the reality is it's probably someone in outstate Minnesota who is down on their luck and collecting, uh, you know, on these programs. So the same thing, you know, you can see this in education. Um, you know, when I was an education reporter, I reported on magnet programs uh, in Cincinnati, which was still under a court order because the desegregation, um, well, the segregation in the schools originally was that was that bad. Um, they were still under court order. They had created magnet schools. The schools were so heavily populated by blacks at this point that they had had all these special programs. They were keeping seats open for white students. Black students were being turned away from the best, best funded, most innovative curriculums in the city because they were ironically holding those stu those seats for white students. So, mm -hmm. You know, we just have to challenge what what is our goal? How are we trying to do it? What are the unintended consequences? You could say the same thing with bail. Um, you know, we have found out that bail disproportionately sure. mm -hmm. uh, affects young uh, people of color. You know, all of the efforts now at police reform, these things could have been seen many years ago. Um, right. You know, the whole war on drugs put sure. countless sure. Um, and, you know, and Ms. Yeah, Ms. people Ms. of Patricia, color in jail long term. Absolutely. Absolutely. And actually, we're going to do an entire show on racism and mass incarceration, uh, which is actually, I think, our May show. Um, but we're going to come back um, in a few minutes and actually talk about this juxtaposition of um, individual versus systemic racism and the individual learning of it and then getting at the root of how to actually make that shift in in the actual media organization on how things are phrased, how things are presented, and what kind of outlook you are providing to the community based on whoever it is that you're talking about, and typically people of color. Um, so be thinking, continue to, to think about that and continue to talk about that as we come back um, to thinking about how now is media impacting racism? How yep. is media specifically impacting racism for the good, bad, the ugly, and or the, the indifferent? I'll see you back here in a minute. I think we're back. Okay. We are yeah, back. We are back. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, the, the technology <laughs> thing is one thing. Like we're doing the live stream and all that stuff. You never <laughs> truly know when you're back and when you're not back. It's like we're oh, back. We're yeah, back well, on air yeah. now. Well, welcome back um, to the uh, WCCL, our race and racism conversation series with uh, our host, Dr. Bernard Price. All right. Um, you know what's so great about this conversation? And, and I'm so thankful really to WCCL Radio for taking, I would call it a risk. Um, this is this this is a big uh, step um, for a radio station to take on this sort of project and to stand with me in this project. And, and I have to let the audience know that uh, CCO Radio did not tell me anything of what to do. They just said, Dr. Verna, what you're doing is the right thing. Go for it. You tell us and let's just let's just make this thing happen. I will partner with you to make this thing happen. So one of the things is great, of course, we're on Facebook Live and 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 uh, people can comment. And so actually we, we have one of our pop guys. Um, Great comment. Visiting a friend in Lakeville, my friend's father hates black people. When he met me, he decided he liked me because I do not act like a typical quote unquote black person that he sees portrayed in the media, movies, etc. Interesting. The father then invited me to the family gathering picnic where the, the rest um, accepted me. This helped them to see that not all African Americans are quote unquote thugs. 
Um, what an amazing comment. Thank you so much, Pop Guy, for um, commenting. I so appreciate that. Um, John, I think this is a great segment to your thought on um, racism in the media, real life experiences. Yeah, and and and, uh, and we appreciate Pop Guy's contribution. I, I just also want to say uh, thank you, Dr. Price, and thank you for our panelists who are a totally distinguished group, and I, I'm honored to be part of it. Um, you know, uh, when you look at, at ways that we see you know, racism in the media, I go back to, to, to leadership and editorial decisions that are made, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion. We've talked about that tonight as being so important. It makes your product better uh, because you have more perspective uh, and, and you're not missing anything when you have different perspectives that you're bringing to the table. And I can't get through this 90 minutes without saying that we at WCCO, we, we are working on more inclusion and diversity. Our company is working on more inclusion and diversity. Um, and, and it's important to me, it's important to us. And I guess where I'm getting at is, is oftentimes I think in editorial decisions on what gets covered and what doesn't, you know, I see stories that, uh, that, um, might be, you know, I'll, I'll see a story that, that if I go online, I'll see that story everywhere. Uh, and it's a story that might be really, uh, particularly important to the African American community and in mainstream media, it's not covered as much. I look at you know, one example I look at is in 2020, unfortunately, with all we've been through, we've lost a lot of celebrities in 2020. And if you look at how some of these celebrities uh, that pass away are covered, um, there's a difference. If it's a celebrity that that might largely appeal to to a white male audience, it's it's oftentimes given more attention and covered differently. Um, so that's another example where we, where we kind of see that in the media. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, that comment, um, and leadership, it's all about leadership, right? Um, so as leaders go, so goes whatever it is you're doing. And so the question becomes whether or not the leadership um, is versed enough, understands enough, understands themselves enough, um, the work of racism to actually be able to ask the question and to be actually be able to see, right? So in these editorial rooms, are the people making the decisions, can they even see racism? You know, like, have you ever had a real conversation about racism in your newsroom, in, you know, with your team? Um, when we started this conversation, what I said to um, John and the team at WCCO is that um, I need to have a racism conversation with your whole staff before we can go into the world and say, yes, we're doing this work mm -hmm. and have your own staff have never had a racism conversation. You know, I think white people are afraid of really four things. One is dying, two is falling, three is public speaking, and four is talking about racism, right? It just scares them to death. Why? Because you've never done it. You don't really, and or you don't want to do it and or you've never really seen it. So um, when, uh, Christy, when you were talking, you know, this notion of why would they ask the question? Why would they ask the question about, about, uh, about race or the significance of their words, right? Um, I, you know, I, I, call, I call it an assassination. It was an assassination of George Floyd. That's what happened, right? Cold-blooded assassination on the street. Um, versus, you know, the media might call it something else, but based on what it's being called is directly connected to the people who are, who have language or don't have language or who are willing to have the confidence and the courage to stand up and say, hey, you know what, these are people. Um, you know, one of the things that many people here, right, you know, in 2020 don't realize is that when racism was put into place as a social construct, you know, African-American people were not um, said to be full people, right? They were three-fifths a person and two-fifths property. So what that meant then is that you didn't have to pay attention to them as a real person. And whether we know it or not, what you were talking about, Miss Patricia, is that those historical things, they've crept and they've stayed in our society. And then they show up in these really kind of, uh, you know, vivid ways. And, we, and we're busy doing our work. So the question is- they, uh, they show up, yeah, they, sh they show up because they serve the interests 
of the majority. Right. It's it's yes. no accident, right? These right. are not the just conflict. leftovers, relics from another mm -hmm. time. They stay in place because it serves the interests of the majority for them to do so. That's why we have the rules we have on, you know, name your topic. Sure. sure. So sure. I to, to yeah. keep the I think part of what place. the media has to do is is expose all of that. That's the job, and it's immense. Yes, yes, yes. Now, Todd, what, what you were talking about was this whole notion of, you know, like, what do we call you, right? And and a lot of white people have kind of gotten stuck on that. Like, well, do we call you black or do we call you African-American? Do we call you this? We call you that. You know what? He, he, here's the deal um, is that uh, as you learn more and as you become more educated, you will begin to become more versed in, in, in understanding how to use that language yourself. And the question is, is that education being done? So I'm just gonna open up for reflections and thoughts on you know, the reflection of racism in the media. You know, something that I think we can't forget is that mm -hmm. the as, when I was a young journalist, I thought I was gonna save the world and tell stories and make a big difference. We can't forget that the reality of the press is that there are stockholders who need to get paid and they wanna return mm -hmm. on their investment. So until, media can figure out a way to have creative content that is reflective, that people want to buy and to pay for. Mm. I don't know that people are gonna make many changes. If it's working, why change it? So there has to be, some, There's. I mean, it's a business. Mm. And the business needs to change because consumers have power to make decisions about what they're watching and what they're reading and how, what they're buying. And that mm -hmm. will make a difference. Right. If you look at the are corporations, are you talking that are, about that, news that, or about broader media? Well, I mean, I think she's talking about like you know, the newspapers that are that are owned by these hedge funds that are strong white male <laughs> that are owning these hedge funds are funneling down how the decisions are being made, and they're con still controlling uh, what's happening. And so, until that changes, that's not true. That, I, that's not happening in newspapers. Um, what's happening in newspapers, I think, goes to more. Uh, what Dr. Price was saying, that you have a lot of people who still don't understand, um, both in leadership positions and in frontline positions, that don't understand how to look at this, how to frame it. They're learning. I'm watching them learn in real time. And it's it's yes. really heartening to me to watch this happening. Uh, nothing of the you know structure has changed. Journalism is under the same pressures it's been for the last you know, 10, 15 years years, but in the midst of all of that, I, I see people, I think maybe for the first time, really grappling with this, grappling with how do we go beyond, mm -hmm. you know, it's not even just about covering communities of color better, although God knows we need to do that. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. about looking at, you know, the, the system as a whole. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a learning curve that's going on. And we have to uh, tell ourselves that that can happen and is not dependent on you know, some stockholder from above giving us permission to do so. I think we have to do that work ourselves. Oh, I agree with you. I'm just saying that they still, that's where the control of the, you know, some of these papers are still coming from, but I agree, we have to do it ourselves. I, I, think, agree. I think at least on the entertainment side uh, the, the, uh, of, of the media, and I can speak specifically to the entertainment side of radio, I just think it takes courage to, to say the heck with that. We're gonna put mm -hmm. something else in front of you mm -hmm. that you might not have seen before. Right. And you haven't sampled before. And you know what? You might actually like it. Right. Uh, you know, uh, right. we think it's good. So you might actually like it. Yes. Uh, yes. And you, so, we, we talk about, you know, you know, changing and, and what the media can do. Uh, and I know we want to get more into that, Dr. Price, and I'll yes. let you lead the mm -hmm. way. But that's, you know, that's just one of them is force feeding it and going, you're going to, you're going to, this is what we're going to put on the table for you, whether you like it or not. And we. Working, why change it? So there has to be some. There's, I mean, it's a business, mm. and the business needs to change because consumers have power to make decisions about what they're watching and what they're reading and how what they're buying, and that mm -hmm. will make a difference. Right. If you look at the corporations, are you talking are, about that, news that, or about broader media? Well, I mean, I think she's talking about like you know, the newspapers that are that are owned by these hedge funds that are strong white male that are owning these hedge funds are funneling down how the decisions are being made and they're con still controlling uh, what's happening. And so until that changes- That's not true. That, I, that's not happening in newspapers. Um, what's happening in newspapers, I think, goes to more 
uh, what Dr. Price was saying, that you have a lot of people who still don't understand, um, both in leadership positions and in frontline positions, that don't understand how to look at this, how to frame it. They're learning. I'm watching them learn in real time. And it's, it's yes. really heartening to me to watch this happening. Uh, nothing of the you know structure has changed. Journalism is under the same pressures it's been for the last you know 10, 15 years. But in the midst of all of that, I I see people, I think maybe for the first time, really grappling with this, grappling with how do we go beyond, mm -hmm. you know, it's not even just about covering communities of color better, although God knows we need to do that. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. about looking at, you know, the, the system as a whole. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a learning curve that's going on. And we have to uh, tell ourselves that that can happen and is not dependent on, you know, some stockholder from above giving us permission to do so. I think we have to do that work ourselves. Oh, I agree with you. I'm just saying that they still, that's where the control of the, you know, some of these papers are still coming from. But I agree, we have to do it ourselves. I, I, think, I think at least on the entertainment side uh, the, the, uh, of, of the media, and I can speak specifically to the entertainment side of radio, I just think it takes courage to, to say the heck with that. We're going to put mm -hmm. something else in front of you mm -hmm. that you might not have seen before right. and, and you haven't sampled before. And you know what? You might actually like it. Right. Uh, you know, uh, right. we think it's good. So you might actually like it. Yes. Uh, yes. And you, so, we, we talk about, you know, you know, changing and, and what the media can do. Uh, and I know we want to get more into that, Dr. Price, and I'll yes. let you lead the mm -hmm. way. But that's, you know, that's just one of them is force feeding it and going, you're going to you're going to this is what we're going to put on the table for you, whether you like it or not. And we think that um, it's the right thing to do. Absolutely. Because it's going to speak to a larger group of, of folks. And yep. the folks that are used to something else might actually like it. And we're going to come back and talk about that. We're going to come and talk about that um, right after this break. Great conversation. Thank you. All right. Welcome back to News Talk 830 WCCO in our Race and Racism conversation series with Dr. Werner Price. And I, I totally love this entire um, conversation tonight. I love our our panelists who are giving great perspectives on race in the media. Mm -hmm. This has been a, a great show so far. Yeah. And you know what I've really enjoyed about it? Um, even though I don't know the panelists, I've, you know, other than John and, and I've, I've heard you like on a call um, doing our conversations with WCCO's team. I I've never met, I've never met Todd or Christy or Patricia and the fact that you all are being real and raw and just, you know, and just sharing your experiences. We just got a call from a 76 year old woman who said she's learning so much right now and it's helping her and giving her the courage that she needs to have these conversations with her own community, her own family. So I love that. So let's just continue. Um, Todd, you were right in the middle of a hot comment. You were about to tell us something about um, racism, how it looks in the media, how it works in the media, your own experience. Oh, well, all, all I was simply going to say is that this is a perfect example of what we're doing right here tonight on this show. And kudos to WCCO, John, for giving us this platform to have real raw conversations that yes. may not be always comfortable but are opening up the platform for all of us to better understand where we all are coming from. So that's what I was leaving it at. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I asked my husband, my husband is Brother Shane Martin Price, and he is born and raised um, in Minnesota, North Minneapolis. And um, so on my way um, out, I said to my husband, I said, sweetheart, you know, um, what do you think of the show tonight? And what's, what's your input? you know, and your thoughts about the show. So he, he sat and he read all the questions. And then he said to me, he said, you know, do you know how long I've been in this town? And every night, cause he watches the news. I never watched the news until I married my husband. I like, like literally, I just never watched the news. I would listen to it like, you know, on the radio, but never like sat and physically watched the news. And he said, you know how long I've been watching the news in this town? And he said, and nothing's really changed with who is actually giving the news to me. And this is my town. And at, at, at what point are, is that going to change? And it goes back to, you know, Christie's your comment on, you know, you can't, you can't imagine being some something, a newscaster, if you've never really seen one. Um, and, and this is a, uh, 
when I first started my consulting business, I was leaving out of the University of Minnesota and written my first book, The Power of People. And here was the advice that I got. The advice that I got as I was leaving to start my own consulting business. Um, one, don't be so like, don't be so personal, you know, Dr. Verna. You know, don't be so real with people. You gotta be more professional. That was first comment. Second comment is was that, you know, if you're gonna do work in this market, you should probably straighten your hair because I have natural hair, right? These are natural twiggly hairs, right? So you should probably just look a little bit more European if you're going, you need to like straighten your hair and just look a little more European if you're gonna get work in this in in in, in, in this market, um, Dr. Verna, right? Um, so those were like my, that was my advice is to not be authentic, not be my, my real African Caribbean fun self. And, you know, and by the way, look a little more white if you're going to make it in this market. Um, and so I decided that I just wasn't going to just follow that advice. I was just going to be myself and, and continue to, to be who I am. The question then becomes, even if you are a person of color, do you have to become more white to even make it in this media market. Like what's really, what is really happening here and what are we going to do about it? What are your recommendations, thoughts, reactions? I mean, my first thought is that's horrific advice. I mean, <laughs> that's horrific. I mean, you know, as a person who's hired talk show hosts over the course of how many years, it's like you have to be authentic and genuine and yourself. And as a person who has done hiring, to all those other people that are out there doing hiring, that's what you have to be looking for is authenticity, and uh, no no matter no matter what it brings you, I mean mm -hmm. it's 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 uh, that's horrific advice. I, I mean, <laughs> I, and I'm sorry, and and, and that's it, again, it makes me sad because it's that's ridiculous that that anybody would suggest you have to be anybody but yourself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All I can well, say is, is I think we have to see diversity yeah. as a Go ahead, Todd. Go ahead. No, that's fine. I was just saying, yeah, that's insane advice. I can't even believe that that's what that somebody like you had to experience. But go ahead, Patricia. I was just commenting on John. <laughs> I, I was just going to say, I think when uh, people are making hiring decisions, they have to see diversity as a value in and of itself. Um, I, you know, for a long time, it was this idea of merit uh, and equality. So if you were the best of the best, it didn't matter if you were also a person of color, you, you know, you were supposed to emerge. And I, I think, uh, first of all, it's not always the best of the best who gets hired for any position. So we need to be honest about that. Um, we also need to look at the entities as a whole. So in a newsroom, if you don't have a diverse, uh, a diversity of people, you cannot have, hope to have a diversity of viewpoints that can bring uh, authenticity and honesty to your coverage and bring that questioning and challenging of ideas that we so badly need. So that part of it, I think, starts at the top. Hey, Patricia's so right. And she just, I mean, I, I you just stole my thunder right there because <laughs> you have to make sure that you diversify. The, you got to make sure that you diversify the work, uh, workplace. And I'm mm -hmm. tired of hearing that there aren't minority candidates out mm -hmm. there for jobs. Mm -hmm. They're out there. Yeah, it's it's your job to find them. You know, if you're not finding them, then you're not doing a good job of recruiting them or or looking for them. And They're not looking. There, right. You there know, you you're not looking. And and I'm not just talking about just from the perspective of like race, but even when we start talking about things where because we very much live in a sexist society, and mm -hmm. there are a lot of qualified and great women that are you know you know should be eligible for jobs, but they're they're getting bypassed by men. So those are all things that should not be happening, and we're in 2020. So, right. you know, when I look at the Minneapolis Star Tribune, I love the fact that Myron Metcalf, that announcement that came out just a couple of months ago, and him coming back, like those are things that give me hope that we're we're trending in a positive direction. So, so Patricia, yeah. I'm right there with you. So are there so this notion that. Um, how do we change the face of, you know, and this is kind of what you're talking about a little bit, uh, Henry, is it's how do we change the face and the look? You know, my husband's saying it's still the same. It's still all white people that are anchors in this town who are the main people giving me the news. How do we change that? 
from my perspective, first of all, when we're looking at an news anchors, think of the news anchors in this town. Many of them have been on the air for 20, 25, mm -hmm. 30 years, mm -hmm. and they're beloved. So I think it's a mistake to say we need to take these people away and put in different and, and swap them out. I think it'd be better to add in because Good. really, if we're talking about diversity, we're talking mm -hmm. about bringing more vice voices to the table. And it's going to take some of these people retiring, honestly, mm -hmm. to start, because you know, you name your favorite weather person, Dave Dahl, I know he's retiring and gosh, that probably got more uh, Facebook comments than an actual important news story, no offense, Dave Dahl, but that's how people are about their news personality. Mm -hmm. So we need to start, when some of these folks start retiring, I think you're gonna see a new face, but that isn't good enough. And to your point earlier about the voices at the table, we also have to think about news as, as a job. Mm -hmm. All of us have worked in some fashion in the media. It is a hard job. Yeah. The hours are terrible. There's a lot of sacrifices made and the money isn't that great. So until the culture of news can change, more people of different ages, of different genders, of different races may want to come and do that work. And that's what it's gonna take to get the newsroom healthier, to get that environment better, and to make that job something that people do so that they can actually earn a living wage. Because so many newsrooms are so young because these people are poor. And <laughs> we need people that can do this for years because we don't also want newsrooms filled with people that are 25 and younger. That also is doing a disservice to the communities they're serving. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you mentioned something there. Um, I, I just wanna so point I out something. About mentoring. Go ahead, go ahead, Patricia. Go ahead. I was going to say, I, I want to point out something that I think, you know, really needs to be pointed out. Um, I've lived in, in this community almost 30 years. Um, there have been lots of hirings made. People mm -hmm. have retired and then they get, you know, they get filled in by different pieces that don't happen to be diverse. So let's just acknowledge there have been lots of chances to add to that diversity. Um, mm -hmm. Also, I think it's important to acknowledge that it doesn't have to be limited to on-air talent. It is important to diversify at every level of your hiring yep. um, so that those voices are at the table when you are selecting the news stories for the next day, when you're talking about those photos that you're going to put, when you're writing the headlines. All of those people need to come with informed perspectives, and that happens from a diversity of hiring in the spots that are seen by the public and the ones that are not seen by the public. They're both important. That's that's really great. You know what it reminds me of a little bit is um is the whole mentoring piece, right? Um, but be, 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 before I go to that, we actually have another comment on on social media that I think uh, I think you you may want to just um, check this out here. Um, uh, Dan's gonna put it up, and um, this is Miss Roxanne Smith. Thanks for being true to who you are, Doctor Vernon. You're so awesome, and glad to see the authentic you. Yes, thank you, Miss Roxanne. I appreciate that. <laughs> Agreed. Now, Miss Miss Roxanne Smith, you know she she is an example. I happen to know her, and she's an example. And she spent she's a white woman who spent her entire life doing the work of social justice. So, um, you know, when she sent me a note, she said, you know, this is social justice work, right? Where we're 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 working to reconfigure how we even tell our story. The media, you know, creates the narrative, right? You actually move forward a narrative, but I think about mentoring. Like how do we um, how do we like make sure that we're actually mentoring into uh, the media more diverse talent, particularly more people of color? I, I'm very pleased to say that that um, our company has has started to do that process. Um, mm -hmm. That was something that that um, I think that um, we recognized. Uh, this summer and said, we've got to do something. We've got to get better. I alluded to that before. And one of the ways that we've done that is we've partnered with HBCUs and, mm -hmm. and, and have already started to, to mentor some of those students. And we're creating fellowship programs to, to get those students into, uh, into our, among other things, our newsrooms um, so that, that we can help guide them and hopefully hire them. Uh, you know, the, uh, I don't know about anybody uh, here, but I can speak for myself in saying that that I've hired a number of people who, have, whether interned for me or you know, or let people you know their their first job, you know, it's it's that connection that I have with them that okay, well, this intern I've known them for the last six months, they've been with me. I'll give them that foot in the door, 
Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a great opportunity for us to do that. And I, th I think that's, it, you know, one good example to do that. And, and uh, you know, it started with our company uh, creating a, a committee, as many companies mm -hmm. have in mm -hmm. recent months, and creating a committee and saying just that, what can we do? And, and, uh, and uh, we've reached out, and I, and I think more companies should do that as well. Right. And, 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 and John, that is not just reactive, right? Uh, you know, clearly we're awake. Yeah. yeah. Right. That yeah. assassination put us, it went, it, it went around the world faster than the pandemic. Right. I mean, it just whipped around the world. And, um, you know, and that young woman who used her personal power to pick up her cell phone and, and create truth media, truth media, telling the truth that was going on. So in this process, then a lot of companies have said, we got to do something. We got to do right. something. Right. Um, so the question begins, says, how do we extend that into the very fiber of how you do your work so that this thing begins to eradicate racism um, at every level? Well, if I understand you correctly, it's, to, it's you know, to get them uh, involved. You know, one of the things that we've asked for, um, our fellowship program, um, for example, is in the process right now. We had to apply uh, for a fellowship WCCO among our 236 radio stations across the country. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we uh, were clear on in the hopes of uh, getting a fellow is to to explain, we want them part of our editorial decision process. Good. We, we want them to, to not just be watching, uh, not just be observing, but we want them participating in what we do. We want them to be, you know, you may see them on the very platforms that you're watching us on tonight. Mm -hmm. um, we want them to be participating actively in in uh, delivering that news for us in some way, shape, or form. It's going to be new for us, so we'll figure it out as we go along. But yeah. it's uh, it's our every intention to make sure that they are learning with actual on-the-job experience. You know, and you know what's so great, John, is that you will figure it out. Christy, yeah. Christy, what are you thinking? You know, it's, it's interesting because I'm, I'm one of those white people who watched George Floyd and went, oh my gosh, what have I been missing all this mm -hmm. time? Mm -hmm. And I'd say to my black friends and they would say, well, yeah, I mean, I can't believe you didn't know this. So I'm one of those people that is now leaning into uh, conversations of race and looked at my own company and said, we have to make changes. Mm -hmm. So we started, a, a give, and, and not just in words, but actually in action. So mm -hmm. we started a, a give a voice team and we have a team and we're out looking for businesses important conversations that are owned by people of color and we can give them press because Good. part of the pe reason that you see a lot of white people on TV is because public relations firms have a lot of white people who work there and they have a lot of white clients and they're pushing that into press. And if we are working with a healthcare system and we have two doctors that we could put on the air at, at some news station and we have a black option and a white option, It's we're thinking now, okay, we wanna make sure that that healthcare system is reflective of the people they serve. And we have a woman who works at the, at the company, she's black, she has a biracial child, and she said, I'm sick and tired of my kid only seeing white experts on the news. So mm -hmm. advertisers own that, marketers own that, public relations agencies, we all can be part of the change in media, but first of all, it's waking up to that there's a problem, and gosh darn it, I hope we're all awake. Yeah, yeah. Um, I thought that's a great point. <laughs> that's, that's a great, great point, point by Christy, because we have to move forward, right? Yes. So, so be, because we have to understand that that this stuff is continuing. So, like for instance, Christy just said, you know, that she saw, you know, George Floyd and 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 his murder and all of that, and and she's like, oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Let's be honest. This right. has been going on forever. Right. We all remember. I remember being at Morehouse when the Rodney King stuff happened. Mm -hmm. And we we marched then back in the day, right? So like, there's still people to this day that are dying. You know, Breonna yeah. Taylor. I mean, so it's continuing sure. to happen. I know that she passed before George Floyd, but I guess my point is that it doesn't stop with George Floyd. Like, we have to continue to create these conversations, move forward, and all work together. And us in the media, we're just a big part of that, right? And how we tell that story, how the media tells that story so that it is a compassionate story, right? We're a human race. These are people, these are families for African-American people who have seen this happen over and over again. You know, we see it happen we mourn and we try to pull ourselves back together again and, and keep going. What I love, you know, Christy, I think the role of the white woman is really important here. Really, really important. Um, and... 
what that means is I just remember telling a, a, a white woman who had gone to this big, big thing. And she said, oh, Dr. Fernand, what can we do to, 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 to diversify? And I said to her, you just went to a major event. I said, did you take one woman of color with you through that door? Even one? And she said, well, no. I said, well, that's what you need to do. I said, you need to connect with and take and mentor into where you, wherever you are, at least one other woman who's a woman of color should go with you, right? Don't go alone. Don't go alone. What else can we do? Todd, go ahead. We got you back on the you, mic. It, well, I, don't you think we challenge her? Don't mm -hmm. you think we challenge ourselves as journalists Good. too to not taking the easy path? I mean, you know, you you're not just saying, okay, these are stories that I can go to, but digging deeper and maybe yes. making yourself a little bit uncomfortable and pushing the envelope to not just say, okay, these are, you know, no offense, Christine, but I mean, PR firms that I've always worked with or whatever, but pushing yourself to say, I need stories that go deeper. I need to find more relevant stories as to where we are today. And that I think as journalists, yes. we have to take right, on. Right, and to know why you're doing it, Todd, to have the right motivation because you've done your own work. You know what, if right. I had in my way, right, every person who is in the media, particularly journalism, has to do work on racism. They have to go through training on what is racism, how it works. So you know it when you come and you're seeing it and you can say to yourself, you know, no, mm -mm, something's not right here. No, mm -mm, no, let's, 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 let's diversify this thing. Let's tell that story differently and so forth. Last, we just have a, just a few minutes left here. Any wrap up comments? I'm going to have a wrap up comments from each of you. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. It's been fascinating. Thank you, Henry Lake for co hosting with me. I so appreciate it. Wrap Wrap up comments. Miss Patricia, a wrap up comment from you. I have, I have one. I am reading a book right now that I would recommend to anyone. It's called Stamped from the Very Beginning, um, The Definitive History of Racist Ideas in America. It is jaw dropping, eye opening. You can train yourself through yep. something like this. You don't have to wait for your company to do it. You can challenge your own preconceived yes. notions. I would recommend everybody, especially every journalist, start that work immediately. Yep, it's it's Kim Day's work. Do it. Do it. Wrap up com comment from you, um, Christy. Get curious. Ask questions. Don't be ashamed if you don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. If you're white, go have a conversation with someone of color. Ask them about their experience. There are people out there who would love to educate you. Take ownership right. and do the work. Excellent. Wrap up from you, Todd. Get uncomfortable. Push the envelope. And get out of get out of what's been the norm for you, and become a better journalist. Yes, thank you. Wrap up for you, John. Well, I I, I have to take the moment to publicly uh, commend uh, our hosts uh, um, uh, here tonight and our hosts on WCCO, and in particular Henry Lake. Uh, Shaletta has the Shaletta Show, eleven to two, talking about mm -hmm. uh, on Saturdays, talking about a lot of, of these same issues. Gerald and Steele have all been absolutely courageous and wonderful on our station and really appreciate um, their work and the work of our other hosts as well. And I did have to get to one real quick. Uh, uh, Barack Obama said in Reverend Pickney's uh, eulogy in South Carolina after the South Carolina shooting, mm -hmm. because I thought of myself when you and I have had conversations, he said, he said, we also are guarding against the subtle impulse to call it back for job interview, but not mall. That's something that we've been talking about here tonight in the media. And um, I said, my name is Johnny. I did get a call with no experience and no education. That's how my career started. And yes. I wonder if it would be that if that I wonder if it would be that way if I wasn't a white man. Wow, we could see we we could keep on talking. We are totally out of time. Henry Lake, thank you so much. What is you get to have the last comment here? I just want to say thank you to everybody that's been a part of the show tonight and the people that have that have sent us a text or sent us a message because this is where it all starts. We're doing the work right now. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Keep doing the work. And you know what? Push your friends to do the work too. Let's create this change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.